Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's live coverage of MWISE here at the Marriott Marquis in Washington DC. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host and analyst, Rob Strecce. We are joined by Taylor Lehman. He is the Director Office of the Chief Information Security Officer at Google Cloud, and Monica Shokrai, the Head of Business Risk and Insurance at Google Cloud. Welcome, Taylor and Monica. Thanks for having Thanks us. Thanks for having us. So, Taylor, I'm going to start with you. You were a former CISO at Athena Health and Tufts Medical Center, and your role now at Google Cloud is helping uh, healthcare organizations and life, life science companies through the same challenges that you faced yeah. in, in working in the industry yourself. So tell our viewers a little bit more about what are the kinds of cyber threats that are facing healthcare organizations yeah. right now. Uh, it's constantly evolving. Um, it's probably best handled by thinking about healthcare as a number of subsectors, like you kind of mentioned in your intro. So you've got hospital systems who are being attacked, uh, largely because uh, digital extortion, ransomware events create tremendous leverage. Uh, they threaten people's safety, and uh, attackers know that and use it to their advantage to compel payment. Um, and there's also a ton of legacy infrastructure in these places uh, that make you know, them sort of target rich in a sense. Um, you've got uh, health insurance companies. Um, they operate mainly like banks, right? They process claims, they move a lot of money. Uh, very, very uh, you know, highly targeted for not just the, the medical information, but also uh, the financial data that they typically have that they keep alongside that. You've got like med tech companies, farm tech companies. These are like a sort of a, a facet of life sciences where you know they're developing drugs and devices to keep people healthy. Um, that's that intellectual property is super valuable, um, not just for you know competitors to acquire, but you know, nation states wanted to, you know, to basically treat and keep their own societies healthy. Um, and you've got, you know, pharmaceutical companies and others who are just, you know, using science to, to you know, build new treatments for people. So there's a variety of um, uh, organizations that make up the healthcare industry and there are the threats uh, and the opportunities are different for each depending on how you look at it. And how, how susceptible do you think the industry is as a whole from a healthcare perspective? Is there a reason why? Is it just the legacy that of the applications and that layer that's really been pulling them back and why they need to really focus on this? Um, I think, um, uh, you know, when folks realize that you could extort business and get paid for it, I think, and just fo focusing specifically on hospitals for a moment, you know, people did a bit of a value equation and said, how bad can I make it for an entity and how low is the bar to achieve that outcome? And I think people pretty much figured out hospital systems, things go bad, people get hurt, and tons of legacy technology everywhere that's hard to manage by organizations that aren't really being reimbursed at a rate and pace that allows them to refresh their infrastructure. So you have a couple of really unique, interesting factors that go into um, why healthcare is an interesting target and why it's so vulnerable. Um, I think if you if you if you step back and like kind of take a macro view, these are also systems that are really important to the safety of entire society. So if you start messing with them, you not only compel the individual organizations to participate, but you also affect the broader society around you, and that's also unacceptable. So there's some interesting um, like you know sort of intersections between uh, societal risk, uh, risk to these organizations going down, what it could mean on an individual basis, but then also. Um, you know, uh, when, when, you, when, you, when you really think about how uh, a number of those threats play out, you, you kind of cause, in a sense, of, you know, catastrophic outcomes for entire communities, cities, and towns, and you know, Tufts Medical Center, where I, where I worked, not only a, a large, noteworthy academic health system, it was also a community hospital system that served people, you know, not just like coming in from out of town to get treated, but it served a very large portion of the Boston area. If that went down, which in recent years, when we had things like the marathon bombing and things like that, that just showed us how much we rely on these organizations. Um, it, really, it really paints a, a, a scary picture when you think about the ramifications of a cyber attack. It, just knowing what happens when these organizations get stressed in the first place. Yeah. So. Because they are so vulnerable and, and, it's, yeah. and they come at a time when people are very vulnerable in their lives. So Monica, how can cyber insurance protect healthcare, healthcare providers from these financial losses? Absolutely, so cyber insurance is part of a holistic risk management program. Not only from a security perspective, are you trying to reduce the risk from a frequency perspective, but if something happens, cyber insurance can help you reduce that severity. Um, particularly because cyber insurance programs come with an incident response panel, a panel of 
um, providers that will help you respond quickly. They'll help you um, negotiate, um, uh, negotiate claims, et cetera. And so from that perspective, we see it as a holistic risk management strategy. But what I think is more interesting about cyber insurance is that insurance is one of the only industries that can start to better prioritize using risk and losses, what controls and what metrics make more of an impact to customers. And so um, over time, if we can get the insurance industry to a place where they're bringing in the right metrics, um, they can help customers improve their security and improve that um, feedback loop, and that's something that we're very interested in. So it, it makes sense that there'd be a lot of education that has to go on for the insurance, having been yeah. at the ins in an insurance industry, uh, Manual Life Financial and John Hancock, where I ran part of the IT there, it, it's one of these where they themselves are trying to get a handle on this, and do you see that as part of what you're bringing to them, is a lot of education as part of the program? Yes, absolutely. So we have a program called the Risk Protection Program, which I think you're touching upon, and within that program, what we're doing is we're helping our customers get access to cyber insurance. The way that we're doing that is that if you look at the cyber insurance industry today, there's 40 page PDFs with a lot of manual questions that CISOs are, are being asked to respond to and a lot of times the questions aren't simply a yes or no question that's easy for the CISO to answer. So what we thought is a couple years ago we pulled back and said cloud providers have a very unique role to play in this space where we can provide scans that have inside out metrics indicative of risk that customers can send directly to insurers so that they can better utilize metrics to understand risk. When you pull back from that, we're also a leader in the security space, Google as a whole, um, in addition to Google Cloud, right? And how can we take that IP and our understanding of security and help the insurance industry better understand their risk? And so as part of this program, there is um, education and thought leadership working with insurers. Right now it's Munich Re and Allianz that we're working with so that they can better understand the metrics that we're providing. So you're having these dialogues with these CISOs and, and Taylor, as a former CISO yep. yourself, what are you hearing from, from these people? What is keeping them up at night? What are their biggest concerns right now? You want to take that to one first? I, I, sure. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's you know really, uh, obviously confidentiality of sensitive data, critical, paired with availability of systems, increasingly critical when you combine the two where you've got folks ransoming data, exfilling data, it keeps, uh, and, then, and then exposing sensitive information publicly, it creates a really interesting set of problems and challenges that CISOs have to really think about. It's not just like, keep it locked down, but I got to keep it online. I also have to minimize it so I don't you know, find myself in a, in a place where you know, I don't want to be. Um, in healthcare, um, you know, we touched a little bit about this, but availability of systems is probably the most important outcome that a CISO can achieve, and any threats to a system going down um, are, need to be at the, at the top of the list. In the last year, we've started to see more and more targeting of healthcare organizations, not just with like ransomware events, but uh, insider threat is something that we're starting to see clearly quite a bit. We're starting to see like symbolic DDoS attacks, like KillNet earlier this year, where hospital systems were being just attacked uh, from other places in the world, um, just because people knew the availability was such a critical thing. And, and you know, really wasn't clear what the outcomes they were hoping for, but you're starting to see more and more of that. I mean, we hadn't seen really relevant DDoS activity uh, since, you know, I want to say almost a decade ago, and I can think of an example at Boston Children's Hospital where we had a significant event, but really hasn't been a thing we've had to deal with. Now it's becoming increasingly more common, and it's being combined with other types of attacks. So I'd say, you know, obviously, um, ransom, ransomware continues to be an issue. Uh, you know, uh, uh, ma making, making sure you've got strong hygiene internally are always a priority there. Ensuring insider risk is understood and covered. Uh, protecting yourself against DDoS attacks, which I think are going to continue. And then, of course, we've got advanced actors now doing really interesting things that we're seeing, and I'm sure we'll be briefed about early, or later today, around like acquiring intellectual property, uh, capturing data on uh, interesting people that they're targeting, uh, scientists, researchers, et cetera. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's almost like kind of who knows what's next. It's a data-rich environment, and healthcare data has a lot of value. But um, I'd say, yeah, I mean, it's it's you know, those are the priorities. Those are the threats that we're yeah. seeing. From yeah. The I, 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 oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to add, from a risk management perspective, speaking to CISOs, one of their biggest concerns is how do I is all the toil that that they're faced with from a day-to-day -day perspective, and how do I figure out what to prioritize, what to do first, if I have a limited amount of time 
where do I focus? And that's an area where we're trying to help them from an insurance perspective as well. Yeah, I mean, that makes total sense because both industries are really data heavy industries. Yeah. There's proprietary information yeah. in both. There's very confidential information in both. I mean, from actuarial tables, that's the IP of an insurance company, all the way through you know, I, patient records, yeah. x-rays, and all yeah. of that stuff. How do you, how do you see this really pushing those industries. I mean, it makes sense, the insurance side of de you know, de-risking themselves. Are you seeing a good uptick in people saying, yeah, I, these insurance regulations, or not regulations, but requirements are changing the behavior of the companies? I think they are, and it's probably more recent within the, the evolution of cyber insurance. So once, a couple years ago when ransomware really upticked, that caused the industry to basically skyrocket their premiums, doubling yeah. and tripping premiums year over year. And that got to a place where cyber insurance became a little bit more relevant in the in the day-to-day -day of a CISO and an organization because it suddenly was costing a lot more. Um, as part of that process, the different requirements that they were asking customers to implement became top priorities because a customer wanted to make sure that they were insured. So I do think that the industry is starting to influence um, what, what people, prioritize from a cybersecurity perspective. Yeah, I, I, I would add, um, I think, and this is kind of happening at the same time as cloud adoption is becoming more where um, CISOs and security leaders, you mentioned toil reduction is a, is a key priority to address threats, but like we're seeing this sort of shift to um, leveraging service providers and insurance organizations, basically people you do business with to adopt this sort of shared fate concept where um, it's, it's more than just, hey, we're going to acquire technology tools people to help solve problems. It's more like we're going to look to our providers to partner with us to more effectively manage sort of the entire spectrum of risk, including insurance. Um, so like an example would be coming onto Google Cloud, the platform itself has a variety of platform controls built in. They're ambient, you can't avoid them. They're there, they're on by default. That brings you up to a certain bar. And then when you, when you actually start to measure your risk and incorporate financial tools like insurance, you can actually do real risk transference which wasn't really available before. Like people would buy an insurance policy and be like, oh please, I hope I don't ever have to use this thing, right? And of course, we were catching up earlier before, it, it certainly doesn't co cover the long tail effects of certain outcomes, like people getting hurt, safety issues, cyber insurance and patient safety don't necessarily go together exactly. Uh, but the, 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 for me, um, what the opportunity is now that we're pe having people moving on cloud, becoming more data driven with their security programs, they're able to effectively transfer risk and with organizations like Google and the, risk, and the risk protection program, you can actually transfer it in a way where it's a responsible transfer, but you know that, that those risks in a sense are covered through effective use of a platform. So you're starting to see like the shift in the connection between, hey, how do I leverage my providers, what I have a little bit more, and then start to do more interesting things that you can only really do if you have a modern tech technology platform, to be honest with you, so. And I, I, would, I like the way you talked about the shared fate aspect yeah. in the sense of, because as Taylor was saying, these are organizations that are, that are also community goods. I mean, Tufts yeah. Medical Center yeah. is providing valuable services to so many different kinds of populations within a community. How are they viewing the reputational risk of these kinds of ransomware attacks and security breaches? I think, I think it, it depends on why it happens, right? Some, sometimes it's just bad luck, sometimes it's negligence. Um, I think it really matters more, not just necessarily the, the outcome or the impact, but it's how you handle it post in terms of being transparent and communicating effectively and helping you know, take the necessary steps to recover, rebuild trust with customers, make sure the investments are in the right places. Um, the reputational risk, you know, um, is real, like people, you know, it shouldn't be the reason why organizations are compelled to be good at cyber, like, right? It should be more on what is the customer outcome we want and why does that matter more than it does what is my, like, you know, personal reputation. But I do think it compels to a certain organization to do the right thing, but really reputational risk is managed post the event. Uh, uh, in, in my experience, I, I, see it, I see it better managed uh, by being as ready as you possibly can be and then having a clear strategy to engage your stakeholders, you know, coming out of it. But, I don't know, Any, anything you would add? It's not something you can insure. So. <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> it's not insurable, unfortunately. We get asked about it a lot in terms of like quantifying risk. Um, how do you quantify reputational risk and impact, but it's not something that's covered under the policy, yeah. so, yeah. 
On no. the shared fate point, um, I was going to talk a little bit more about one of the things that we're seeing within the industry. Um, At Bay is an insurance company. They came out with a report that essentially said for their customer base, if you use workspace, uh, the chance of a claim, of a loss, is down 40% compared to other email providers. So when you think about that, the power that the insurance industry can bring to helping customers make decisions on what, uh, risk, risk adjusted decisions on what technology they're going to provide, um, helps overall where a customer might not know the difference between different technology providers. So that's something that we're interested in working with them on. Yeah. Um, over and time. I think that, that level of precision and risk measurement and then how you treat it yeah. is going to get better and better and better as people adopt more modern stacks, looking at data that comes off the system to inform them of risks, pairing it with intelligence coming out of places like Mandiant to sort of you know, create a better understanding of the risk, the effective control, and then if transference is a great option, making that almost click, 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 and you're done, right? Uh, I see that definitely as a trend that's going to continue to occur. Yeah, I agree. Certainly. Well, looking into your crystal balls, what do you see? I mean, you, just, you, you mentioned that as a trend. Are there any other themes that you're seeing emerging, particularly as we are here at MWISE? From an insurance perspective, I think the theme is better uh, inside out metrics over time. I think more and more insurers are, start are going to start adopting that. What you're seeing they're already adopting is a lot of outside in scans and, and the two industries merging, but that trend will continue. Uh, there's a term insure sec that's emerging of the, the combination of the two industries and I, yeah, I think it'll only accelerate. Yeah, I would just say uh, I'm hopeful for the future. I think things are generally going to continue they're going to be difficult, but we're going to continue to see improvement as more and more organizations sort of uh, understand the threats they face and then put controls in place and programs like insurance in place. I think on the insurance side, the, the thing that I'm most looking forward to is um, seeing the adoption of more quantitative mechanisms to, to measure risk in real time. Not just like, oh, I'm going to model a scenario, it's going to take me 30 days to pull the data together, run a Monte Carlo analysis and basically like for this one really precisely defined risk, my exposure is X. I think we're going to see that feedback loop get shorter and shorter and shorter and in more and more real time so that we can make risk-based decisions and like I said, even on a precise scale, be able to have more options in how we treat those risks that don't involve, hey, I got to go rack $20 million of new equipment, new firewalls, whatever to get it in, like especially with, with code now being the way cloud is provisioned, the, seeing the, the combination of more precise risk measurement and the ability to move quickly uh, with less toil, I think it just means the, the I, I'm personally excited if more healthcare companies get on cloud, start using intelligence driven approaches, start measuring risk faster, means we're going to have safer and safer health systems. Well that's an optimistic note to end on. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much Taylor and Monica for joining us. Awesome. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. I'm Rebecca Knight, stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage here on theCUBE for Rob Strecce.